Katie's going to do her presentation now, so I'll switch these off. We are in blue. <laughs> okay, um, my keyword presentation is on Midsummer Night's Dream, of course. Um, the uh, words I'm going to be looking at all fit a kind of a common theme that I found. Um, Shakespeare, I, it's, it all has to do with animals, actually. Um, I found that Shakespeare uses a lot animal imagery steady, steadily throughout this play. Um, the characters of Titania, Oberon, Bottom, Hermia, and Helena all speak of animals at various points in their dialogues. Um, I kind of feel that this is probably Shakespeare's vessel of displaying how humans are connected to the natural world, um, which was a very Renaissance idea. Um, it kind of reminded me of the Vitruvian Man as the human body is an analogy for the workings of the universe. Um, I'll get more into this a little bit later because I kind of think that maybe the fairy world represents the spiritual world and the animals in the wood maybe represent like the natural world and the humans have to interact with both to be human and we'll get to that later. But um, I found a lot of these words had to do with metaphors and um, when I was doing my research I found that um, some scholars think that um, Shakespeare was a real animal activist. And um, they used for one of the examples was the fly scene in Titus Andronicus. That, you know, um, it wasn't so much for a joke, which I think it is, but um, Shakespeare really thought that a fly needed to be, you know, respected. And um, even if it's just a fly, I don't know. But <clears throat> so the first word I'm going to be looking at is canker. And today it's a noun. Um, comes from the from Old English, which is used directly from the Latin cancrum, um, which is where um, our modern English cancer is derived. Um, it is an eating, spreading sore, ulcer, or a gangrene. Um, but Shakespeare uses it as a caterpillar, a noun. Um, uh, and one of these speeches, uh, Titania kind of gives is to some some to kill cankers in the musk rose buds, some more with rear mice for their leathern wings. And later on, Canker pops up um, with Hermia uh, when she says, oh me, you juggler, you Canker Blossom, you thief of love. Um, here, Canker Blossom means trickster, and it doesn't really have anything to do with Caterpillar. So I looked up in um, the OED, and it just says that Canker Blossom means a worm that cankers or eats away at a blossom. But I kind of feel that maybe it means that, you know, has a, since a caterpillar is kind of a trickster, he kind of changes from, transforms into a butterfly, that, that might have something to do with, you know, the natural, um, have something to do with a caterpillar, you know, he can be, he's a trickster kind of, he can change into something beautiful. And, um, and the other word that was used in the first line I went over, um, uh, of course, uh, rear mice is a word I hadn't heard of when I read about when I read read about it. Or it's mainly archaic. I found out, um, <coughs> but Shakespeare uses it to mean bats. Um, from the Old English "aramus," meaning rear mouse, or our modern English bat. Um, and of course, there's that line again: some to kill cankers in the musk rose bud, some more with rear mice for their leathern wings. Um, later, later on, Oberon um, mentions with laden wings and batty wings doth creep. So here we see that batty refers to bat-like, so the modern word did exist then. Um, and it was derived from the Middle English bake, and then to Scandinavian, and from Scandinavian not bata, meaning night bat. So I thought that was kind of interesting how he had, he's able to use a different, you know, various <coughs> vocabulary there. Um, and uh, significance, um, <clears throat> to put them kind of in the sense where it came from, uh, Titania is referring to her family mm -hmm. servants and how they will kill cankers and make some more with rear mice to acquire supplies to make elf coats um, after they sing her to sleep first. Um, but here we go again, kind of going off on a tangent um, about the fairies. Um, <clears throat> Like this, Shakespeare's description of fairies and their natures, I think um, when I was doing my research, they really helped to shape our modern view of supernatural beings today as tiny dreamlike shadows that really do no harm. Um, but apparently back in Shakespeare's day, the commoners really, um, 
believed that fairies were thought of as wicked souls who needed to be appeased. Um, they could bring famine and misfortune to families. Um, that could really do a lot of harm, but Shakespeare here kind of makes them out to be these little, you know, sprites that really don't do much. <laughs> but um, they, they, they can bring, be helpful to humans without having to be bribed. Um, and uh, one of the last words I'm going to be looking at is hind. Um, today it's an adjective um, from the Gothic hindana, meaning situated at the back or posterior. Um, and Shakespeare uses it as a noun meaning doe. And this is from the Old Norse hind, meaning the female of the deer, especially of the red deer, specifically a female deer in and after its third year. Um, Helena talks about the hind, the dove pursues the griffin, the mild hind makes speed to catch the tiger, bootless speed when cowardice pursues and valor flies. Um, so, of course, this is when Helena chases Demetrius and declares her love for him, even after he basically shoots her down. Um, so she compares herself to a doe and him to a tiger, her way of deme I, I believe her way of demeaning herself enough for Demetrius to take pity on her. Um, earlier she compared herself to a spaniel, and I believe that these animal metaphors kind of help to contribute to the ongoing theme of male dominance that is prevalent in this play, among other, a lot of other themes. Um, of course, the woman being ruled by her heart instead of her head. So, um, basically, I feel that the animal Im imagery helps to show that the play is a renaissance piece. Like I said, it's kind of like a um, opposite going on here from fairies, the fairy world, the spiritual world, the shadows. They're not exactly completely physical, but animals are very physical, and um, but they're not so much spiritual beings, and so the humans kind of interact between the two worlds, kind of creating kind of like humans are spiritual and um, physical beings, and that's kind of what makes up what a human being is. Um, of course, the themes are more per, are come out better with um, the use of animal metaphors, and um, and here we go again with the evolution of humanism, um, of the human being being associated with nature and um, and the spiritual world, kind of elevating them, I think, because they have both worlds incorporated in into uh, a human, a living being. So. Um, that's all I have. Thank you very much.